Hello, readers. Coming up, it's episode number 211 with Florence Williams on Heartbreak. First, I wanted to encourage you to check out our website at booksonpod.com. While there, you can sort through past shows by episode number, book title, author's last name, or sort by category. For instance, select the animals and nature, history, or science and medicine category for episode number 188 with Bill Shutt on Pump. Hi, this is Bill Shutt, author of Pump, A Natural History of the Heart. And you're listening to Books on Pod with Trey Elling. Hello, readers. Florence Williams is an award-winning journalist, author, and podcaster whose work includes the environment, health, and science. Her newest book is titled Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey. Florence, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So what inspired this book? Unfortunately, what inspired it is um, personal disaster, I would say. Um, I mean, typically the way I approach science journalism is through questions, you know, occurring in my own life, my own curiosity, I sort of follow that. Um, I, I've written all my books kind of loosely in the first person, um, but of course this one was much more personal. And um, it's because uh, my marriage unexpectedly blew up after 25 years. Um, one day my husband said that he wanted to go follow his soulmate and I was not it. So um, it, was, it was a shock to me. It was uh, an emotional blow. I had really no idea. Maybe I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. Um, we had two teenagers. I was, uh, had just turned 50. And I was really surprised and baffled actually by how much the pain registered in my body. Uh, and I wanted to know why. I mean, there was so much art about heartbreak, you know, so much sort of, you know, bad pop music, so much very good poetry. Um, but I, I didn't know where the science was. I didn't see a lot of science. And so I think the journalist in me would just like put on that hat. It kind of helped me, I think, cope, you know, with the pain just to kind of, you know, be a journalist and try to pursue some answers. Um, but I also think, you know, there was a story to be told there that I wanted to uncover. You uh, really did go all over the place in search of those answers. That includes meeting with a bio uh, biological anthropologist named Helen Fisher, who you hoped would help shine some light on heartbreak for you. How did she enlighten you on what is happening neurologically to somebody who has been dumped? I, I met Helen Fisher just uh, a few weeks actually after the split. And uh, at that time I wasn't sleeping. I, I was losing a ton of weight. Um, my gut bacteria was freaking out. Um, I just, I felt awful. And uh, I met her at a conference. We were both speaking there and I said, can I, can I come talk to you about, about my, my marriage ending? And she, she said, sure, kiddo, you know, come, come on over. And um, she said, are you sleeping? I said, no. She said, are you, are you eating enough? I said, no. Uh, she said, do you feel existentially freaked out? I was like, yes. And she said, I can tell you what's happening. Um, she typically studies the neurotransmitters of falling in love. Um, but, but she's also one of the few people who's actually looked at kind of what happens on the other side of love. And she's put dumped people in brain scanners, uh, image their brains. And what she finds is that there are two parts of the brain that are sort of active when people who have been rejected in love look at pictures um, of their departing beloveds. And she's found that one of those regions is associated with addiction and craving. Because uh, you know, just because you um, have lost someone you love doesn't mean that you stop loving them. Um, your body is still very much um, you know, attuned to their presence. Your bodies actually co-regulate. You know? And so when they disappear, um, um, you know, that part of your brain is still gonna be active. And then the other part is really associated with physical pain. So she said that 
heartbreak is experienced in the same way as a toothache. <laughs> Um, similar parts of the brain, the dorsal anterior cingular cortex. But she also says that um, in a lot of ways, the heartbreak is worse because it can last much longer. Uh, it's wrapped up in so much of your identity and your self-concept. Uh, it's sort of overlain with this um, uh, feelings of rejection and ostracism, which we also know are sort of deeply evolved responses. Um, to the loss of love when we've been rejected or cast out. And she said, you know, it's perfectly understandable that your body is in a state of fight or flight because suddenly you feel like you've been abandoned and your brain isn't really making a distinction between whether you've been abandoned on the savanna and you're circled, circled by hyenas or whether you've been rejected in love. And not only do the heartbroken experience physical pain, but also uh, a sort of physical illness that comes along with it as well. And we'll certainly get deeper into this uh, in terms of your personal journey. But first though, what is Takatsubo cardiomyopathy and how is it different from regular heart issues? Sure, you know, we, we tend to think of heartbreak as kind of a metaphor, but it turns out that it's actually a literal medical condition um, in the aftermath of a big emotional blow or tragedy. Um, so we see this um, sometimes in people who've lost a partner um, or a pet. There are instances in the medical literature of people who suffer this after their soccer teams lose in the World's Cup. <laughs> they take it very, very seriously. Um, it, it, presents in some ways like a, like a classic heart attack. Um, the heart isn't pumping, but in imaging, it's, it's revealed that it's not caused by a blockage of an artery. Um, it's caused by one of the quadrants of the heart, the left ventricle, um, ballooning out, getting distended. So takatsubo is a word for lobster pot in J Japanese. And it means that this lobe of the heart um, you know, sort of sticks out, it can't pump efficiently. Um, so about, uh, I think 5% of all heart failure is sort of a result of this Takatsubo. Um, it has a fatality rate of about 5% and about 20% of people will go on to have some increased risk of cardiac disease, but, but most people do recover from it. Um, and actually since, since the book came out, I've gotten lots of emails from people saying, yeah, I got divorced and then I got Takatsubo or I'm, I'm suffering from this. And in the book, I talked to a woman whose boyfriend leaves her and gets another woman pregnant, 41 years old. I had an episode of this, um, super dramatic. And interestingly, estrogen helps protect against the most serious effects of Takotsubo too, correct? Yeah, I think about 80% of people who get Takotsubo are postmenopausal women. So there's something protective about the estrogen sort of um, counterbalancing, I think, the flood of stress hormones that are acting upon receptors um, in, in the heart. So happy marriages are good for the health of each partner, but why do people in so-so marriages suffer health-wise more than those in bad partnerships, according to University of Utah professor Bert Uccino? Yeah, I had an interesting conversation with him. And at first it was really depressing because he told me about how great for your health, good marriages are, you know, people in good marriages live 20% longer and they feel less pain. They recover more quickly from illness. Um, they are less likely to get metastatic cancer, you know, on and on. And I was like, I, um, and, but then he told me that, that half of marriages actually are not good marriages. They're sort of so-so marriages or they're bad marriages. And interestingly, the people in so-so marriages um, also seem to suffer from a lot of heart, uh, a lot of uh, health, poor health outcomes. And it's even more so than people in, in kind of bad marriages, which was interesting to me. It's the so-so marriages are the ones where the behavior of your partner is sort of unpredictable. Sometimes you can count on them for support, but sometimes you can't. And so maybe you don't have your sort of coping mechanisms um, in place. Uh, you can be sort of disappointed and stressed out over and over again. Um, so that was interesting to me. And then I said, well, maybe it's better to be divorced then 
you know, than to be in a so-so marriage. And I, I thought that perhaps was, was, was something positive for someone in my position. And he said, well, actually, no. People who are divorced are still worse off than any other demographic, more so than people who are never married, um, more so even than widows and widowers. Um, because there's something about divorce itself that is very, very stressful. It's high conflicts often. Um, it's again, you're, you're, you're dealing with a sort of loss of self-concept, loss of control of your life. You, especially if you're a woman, um, you know, serious financial um, distress, um, often there are children, but you know, on and on. So um, it's considered actually after death, um, kind of one of the most stressful, the second most stressful life event you can go through. And, and your body knows this. So uh, whether you're going through divorce or death or anything else, there's something called high openness that can actually help a person recover from stressful events. What exactly is this? Yeah, after I talked to Bert Uchino at the University of Utah and I got really depressed, um, he said, you know, you might want to go next door and talk to Paula Williams. So Paula Williams is a, another psychologist who studies um, uh, it's kind of how people get through difficult life events, um, but she focuses on individual traits and characteristics, whereas Uchino really looks at these sort of broad population-based stats. And she said, yeah, you know, the statistics are terrible for divorced people for health outcomes, but um, we know that there are some people who are able to really sail through this and be resilient. And there are some personality traits associated with that resilience. So I was really curious about that. I was very eager to find out uh, what those traits were and how I could um, get some of that. Um, and she said resil resilience is really in her lab linked to this personality trait of openness. We don't think of personality traits as being, um, you know, mutable over time. You know, you're either extroverted or you're not, you're conscientious or you're not, um, you're anxious or you're, you know. Um, but openness is one that there may be some possibility to move the needle on. And if you can move the needle on this when you want to, <laughs> because high openness is associated with uh, things like curiosity, um, um, being open to new experiences, um, intellectual um, curiosity, sort of adventure seeking. Um, it's associated with joy. Uh, it's associated with the ability to, as she told me, um, create a narrative about past bad experiences uh, in a way that helps you move on. Uh, and specifically, there's one subtrait of openness that she's interested in, and it's um, what she calls aesthetic sensitivity. People who are moved by art or moved by beauty. Um, these are the ones who, in brain studies, uh, their white matter is shown to have more connections between their frontal cortex associated with their self-concept and parts of their brains associated with sensory or motor um, processing. These are the people she thinks who are able, even when they're facing something really difficult, they're able to notice beauty and feel more connected to something outside of themselves. And they sort of do this on a regular enough basis that when things get dire, um, they maybe have a little more perspective or they're still able to experience this sort of joy and happiness uh, that can give them kind of a handle for moving on. And so when she told me that, I found it wildly hopeful. I was like, okay, beauty, I like beauty, I like nature. This is where I'm gonna go find it. And I think a lot of this plays into this idea of awe that really did feel like an epiphanous moment for you on your personal search to figure out how you can go about feeling better mentally, uh, physically, physiologically, to, to find ways to be awed, to be inspired by the world around you. Yeah, absolutely. I felt a, a sort of urgent need to try to calm down. Um, and to try to feel better. And that's because I was suffering some health outcomes and health consequences from all the stress that I was feeling. So um, my pancreas at this point had sort of stopped working very well. Um, I ended up in the emergency room with really high blood sugar. 
I was diagnosed with type one diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease that I later found out um, is sometimes triggered by emotional stress. Um, there was another scientist I talked to, a psychologist who said, we think that there's an inflammation story related to divorce. I was like, whoa. Um, so I wanted to get better fast. Here was Paula Williams dangling this potential lifeline to me that I had never heard before. I had never heard that beauty could be an antidote to heartbreak or to loneliness or to grief. And so I thought that was really interesting, um, you know, for the, for the book and for, for reasons of science, but I was also like, I need this as a human being. I need to, I need to try this. Honestly, the most mind blown that I was in this book had to do with what is happening at the cellular level with heartbreak. You just mentioned that you were diagnosed with type one diabetes in that first year of your separation. And scientists, including Stanford University molecular geneticist, Michael Snyder, have found that stress can trigger an autoimmune response, including autoimmune diseases. How so? Yeah, well, so um, scientists have been asking that question. Why is it that lonely people die earlier? Why is it that they're more likely to suffer for, from heart disease? Why is it that they're more likely to get Alzheimer's and dementia and a whole bunch of other diseases, including diabetes, other metabolic diseases? Um, and why is it that they're more likely if they do get cancer to have it spread? The answer is probably in the immune system, so thought. Dr. Stephen Cole. Um, he's an immunogeneticist who I met with um, at UCLA. And he's been asking exactly this question. Why are lonely people dying earlier? Um, and what he has found is that our transcription factors um, you know, are designed to be responsive to our external circumstances. Our immune system is supposed to respond as we need it to sort of life events. Um, our immune cells, white blood cells get made in our bone marrow, you know, every couple of days even. Um, and so what he's found is that in lonely people, their, their transcription factors sort of um, upregulate genes associated with inflammation, but they can't do everything. So they downregulate genes associated with viruses. And, you know, look, why would this be? Like, what's the evolutionary reason for it? And he has a really interesting theory about it, which is that you know, if you feel alone, if you feel like you've been abandoned, um, you know, our, our sort of, um, you know, prehistoric <laughs> Pleistocene bodies associate that with perhaps a threat state in which we're about to get attacked, you know, by a predator. I mean, we're now alone in the jungle. Um, we're gonna need this inflammation if we're gonna have some sort of flesh wound. And so that fight or flight response upregulates inflammation. It could be really adaptive, you know, if you're out in the jungle for, you know, a week or two. But if you're, if you're lonely, you know, for months and years and decades, like some people are um, increasingly in modern societies, um, that's gonna, in the words of Cole, he says that, that is a molecular soup of death. And he said to me, if you can't feel better from your heartbreak, you're gonna, you're gonna face a death spiral. I was like, oh my God, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? And he just looked at me and he said, you know, don't be heartbroken forever. Easier said than done. Easier said than done, right. And well, I mean, he's, he's done, his lab has actually done a lot of research with different interventions, looking at, at how people's trans transcription factors change after they do things like meditate for a couple months or after they do things like volunteer. Um, and uh, I mean, we, you know, we can talk more about this, but um, one of the things that he's found is that the antidote to loneliness, at least as far as your immune system, is not um, necessarily hanging out with other people. And it's not necessarily doing sort of self-care, you know, like, um, um, uh, you know, doing things that make you feel sort of happy, or, you know, eating the ice cream, watching Netflix, you know, those aren't necessarily things that are going to actually change your genetic transcription factors. So what he's found that does 
is what he calls um, mission, purpose. People who are, don't necessarily go through life feeling, you know, mirthful, but the ones who actually feel like there's a big why in their life, they know sort of why they do what they do. Um, these are the ones who actually have the shiniest, healthiest immune factors. And often that sense of mission and purpose helps create a, a community for them. Um, but it's not necessarily that sort of hanging out with people that that is the solution. It's really this kind of like broader sense of mission. That's interesting. I, you know, the, the sense of why is obviously important. I feel like there's a toolbox of things at your disposal, though, and you went through this. I mean, you had your friends that you turned to, that you shed tears with, that you bounced uh, what was going on in your head off of. But there are also healthy habits that can help you take care of yourself in ways that are maybe a little bit healthier than eating a pint of Hagen dazs just before bed at night. Things like exercise, you obviously are a big believer in nature, as am I. So getting out in nature, whether it's on a river, or going out on hikes, I mean, things that maybe distract you in that moment, but ultimately are helping build uh, this stronger person for when you do eventually come out the other side. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, frankly, I just wanted to try everything that mm -hmm. had some science behind it because mm -hmm. I knew I needed to get better sooner uh, than later. Oh, we'll, we'll get to the psychedelics shortly. <laughs> Uh, first, though, what is the hot sauce test and how does it show a rejected person's willingness to be cruel in return? Yeah, so, so there's a lot of interesting new science on rejection. And I was eager to dive into that because people who feel like they've been rejected behave differently. Um, they, um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, they, they feel more threatened, you know, um, they're more eager to sort of see harm around them. They're sort of more vigilant to that. Um, they can become um, sort of more aggressive and um, cruel to people around them. People who've been rejected in love, um, you know, become sort of operatic about it. I mean, th and there are some gender differences there. I mean, women tend to become um, um, more eager to, um, well, I think both sexes actually, uh, have less impulse control. So there's more um, sort of unprotected sex, more drugs, more alcohol. Uh, you know, our, our, um, our sort of judgment centers of our brains aren't, aren't kind of as salient as they normally are. Um, but both sexes also become a little bit vengeful mm. towards their departing love. And that looks different in men and women. Uh, so there's this hot sauce test. <laughs> Uh, that psychologists kind of created, and it's, it, it's a complicated study design, but basically um, uh, heterosexual men and women who don't know each other are partnered for a task. Uh, and in half the cases, um, the, the one who's not the research subject, but the one who's sort of like the actor in the experiment will say, oh, I'm sorry, I have an appointment. I can't finish the task. And the other half will say, you know what, I don't really want to work with you. I'm going to work with this other woman in the next room. And so it sets up this kind of dynamic of rejection. And then the one who's left behind is able to fill a cup of fiery hot sauce that that same partner is going to have to taste later on as part of this supposed taste test. And so the ones who feel like they've been rejected, as opposed to the ones who just know that the person had to go leave for an appointment, they'll pour like twice as much fiery hot sauce <laughs> in their partner's cup. That's for women. Women will pour twice as much in. But when you reverse the, the sexes and it's the men who feel rejected, they will pour four times more hot sauce in the cups of, of the women who've left. Wow. And, and we know that, you know, partner on partner violence, right, is um, a huge problem. And it's mostly um, men um, harming the women with whom they feel um, a threatened relationship. People swear more when under duress. Is there an evolutionary rationale for this? <laughs> yeah, I noticed I was really doing that a lot, <laughs> a lot. And so we're, another friend of mine who was going through divorce was doing, we, we, the two of us were just like sailors. It was really funny. Um, yeah. So there is some, there is some research behind this um, where researchers had people um, stick their arms in freezing, freezing, freezing ice water and um, 
let some of them curse as much as they wanted with their favorite curse words and told the other ones, you know, they weren't allowed to curse. Uh, and then they had to report their pain. And the ones who cursed really felt better. Um, and, and the theory there is that when you're, when you're cursing, <laughs> you're um, perhaps getting yourself psyched up kind of for a fight, you know, the way sport teams do or people going into battle um, may release more testosterone, more adrenaline, and there's some um, pain relief associated with that. What does the neuropeptide called tachykinin or TAC2, and I probably brutalized the, uh, the actual pronunciation of that word, or TAC2, tell us about what's going on in the brains of those suffering from heartbreak? Yeah, this is similar to, um, you know, the behavioral changes I was talking about with, with people who feel rejected. This is a MICE study uh, at the University of Utah. Um, Moriel Zelikowski has been isolate, socially isolating mice, basically, in effect, sort of creating loneliness for them. Uh, and she finds that the ones who are socially isolated become a lot more aggressive. So they're, they're much meaner to sort of intruders who may wander by. Um, they're, uh, they act more neurotic and anxious, less likely to explore their environments, for example. Um, and she's also found that that behavior seems to be linked to a release of this peptide TAC2 in their brains. So she's looking at actually possible kind of loneliness antidote drugs um, that inhibit TAC2. When you can inhibit TAC2, it seems like these behaviors really get better. So, you know, maybe there's some pharmaceutical solutions to loneliness in our future. I don't know. <laughs> uh, why does nature help those struggling with breakup according to science? Well, you know, I wrote this book before this one called The Nature Fix, <laughs> and I looked a lot at the science of how um, our brains and bodies react to being in different environments, including, you know, I, I wore a portable EEG cap for part of those studies, and, um, you know, there are scientists measuring people's cortisol levels, respiration rates, heart rate variability, all kinds of things indicating that um, people even kind of subconsciously feel more relaxed when they're in a pleasant natural environment. There's something about how we evolve, probably outside, uh, where our perceptual systems are, are comfortable reading information in natural landscapes. Uh, you know, we have this sort of, there's a biophilia hypothesis that we are just innately um, bonded to other living things, other living creatures, plants, trees, etc. cetera. Um, and so it, we know that our nervous system calms down outside. We know the cortisol levels drop. We know that respiration rates drop. Um, we know that people in surveys say that they're, they're having fewer negative thoughts and sometimes more creative connections. I mean, the research goes on and on and on. So I thought, well, with heartbreak, um, you know, I need to feel calmer. I need to calm my own nervous system. I need to get out of fight or flight. Uh, so I started spending a lot more time even and drawing on the lessons from the nature fix uh, more than I ever had. I, I tried to go outside and, um, you know, walk the walking, the movement really helped me. And there's also some research showing that movement can be really helpful for helping people feel a little more calm. Um, but I also thought I, I want a really big dose of this particular therapy. So I, started planning a 30 day wilderness trip, um, thinking this is a big, this is a big heartbreak. Um, what I need is a really big dose of wilderness. And what, I, what did I, that entail? It, yeah, I had mixed sort of mixed results. Um, so I, I found a river in Utah, the green river, um, which I had paddled actually several times before parts of it. Um, I am a paddler. I've been a paddler for my whole life but I've never, I'd never been alone in the wilderness. And I wanted to plan a trip. I wanted to do 30 days, um, half of which was with friends and family um, and then half by myself because I'd never been by myself. I felt like I needed to learn how to be alone. I loved the metaphors of a river trip. I needed to learn how to sort of paddle my own boat now. And I, I liked the idea of moving sort of from the broken badlands of my marriage to flowing into a new sort of happier landscape. Um, I wanted to access bravery so that I wouldn't be so afraid of my future. I had so much anxiety that was sort of driving some of these changes in my immune system. So I thought the river trip um, would be an interesting 
um, intervention. And then I also worked with Steve Cole at UCLA to measure my blood cells, my white blood cells before the trip and after it. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the findings with Steve Cole before, after, and then also a third time that you had your blood work tested. But I'm somebody who is very passionate about rafting as well. It is truly one of the most soothing things for the soul that exists on this planet. I've never actually done overnight trips before, much less one that would involve me being in the wilderness by myself for two weeks. It makes me anxious. I'm getting a uh, tightening of my stomach just thinking about <laughs> you doing that for 15 days. So I guess I have to ask, what exceeded your expectations with this trip and what fell short of uh, what you were hoping to find as a part of this 30-day journey? Yeah, um, I think that um, it it was really a mixed bag. I mean, it was great to have time and space to think um, because we don't often get that, you know, at this, le at this level. Um, I had been trying to sort of become better at meditating, which I think I, in some ways that's an oxymoron. Like you're not really supposed to strive to be good at it, but <laughs> right. I think you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, it was so quiet in the canyons of Utah. There were no, no roads, you know, barely airplanes overhead, very few people. You need permits for these sections. It's, they really, um, you don't really don't run, run into very many people. I had a canoe. Um, so that was cool. Like I felt like I was able to sort of de just devote more time to that practice. Um, I did a lot of reflection and rumination. Um, and, and interestingly, that wasn't so great because what happened was I, I started thinking about all the ways that I had contributed to the end of my marriage. And I spiraled into this, like, just feeling like a huge loser, mm. like no one was ever going to love me again. And I, I had this flaw and that flaw and this flaw and that flaw. And I just went down this sort of spiral of that. Whereas normally, you know, if we're with other people, you know, our friends can tell us that we're being an idiot, you know? Um, they really do. They, 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 they keep us out of these dark holes. So um, that was one problem. And then, um, you know, interestingly, when I got off the river trip and we analyzed my blood, it really didn't look any better. So that was disappointing. I do wonder if it would have looked better after the first 15 days where you were actually able to share that experience yeah. with those that you loved. Exactly. That would have been a really interesting, that would have been a really interesting study, but I had no way to sort of get the blood out halfway right. through, um, you know, and freeze it and ship it. Um, yeah. I mean, so the problem is you're not, your body is not really going to relax when you're in the wilderness alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could relax maybe for like part, parts of the day, you know, when you're, hearing the bird song, you know, for a few moments, but then you have to start thinking about, you know, where are you going to camp? And, um, you can't screw up because as I said, there are no roads, I there are no phone. Um, you have to, no one to take care of you. If you step on a scorpion, you know, or you get an infection. So, um, humans aren't supposed to be alone in the wilderness. You know, that's why we're a social species. It's, we feel safer when we're together. And we're able to thrive when we're together. It's when we're alone that bad things happen to humans. And our, our, our nervous systems know that and they sort of go into high alert. So, um, so yeah, I think that was the problem <laughs> is that I was alone. You're right that loneliness matters not just to the individual health outcomes, but also to political systems. What do you mean by this? Well, when people are lonely, they really uh, seek companionship or they seek affiliation. Um, loneliness is kind of, um, it's an interesting emotion because it's really subjective. Um, you know, you can be in a marriage and feel lonely, or you can live in a city and feel lonely. Um, it's, it, it's, it's almost a cue that our brains put out for us to respond. You know, if you're feeling lonely, it creates a sense of wanting to seek companionship and bonding. And so people who are socially isolated and lonely are gonna be like particularly sucked in probably um, to ideological groups. Um, you know, if you're 
um, trolling the internet, uh, you know, you may be more likely to fall in with people who are espousing um, somewhat similar political views and, and then going deeper and deeper and sort of becoming more and more radicalized because there's an increased sense of belonging um, when you're feeling um, almost like you're in an outcast situation with someone else. If you, if you have a lot of anger towards your government and you find other people who have anger towards your government, that's really, re really especially reinforcing um, and especially bonding. But it happens on both the you know, political right and the political left. People find their tribes, right? And they want to find them the lonelier they are. We are tribal creatures when you boil it all down to the bare bones of things. So as we talked about earlier, you did try some alternative methods to feel better and find that happiness. What is eye movement desensitiz uh, desensitization and reprocessing <laughs> or EMDR, if I can get it out, and yeah, it's it, a it have a positive impact on you? Yeah, EMDR is a um, sort of therapy modality um, based on this concept um, of bilateral movement. So, I mean, typically if you do it one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, they may move a pen back and forth across your face and your eyes are supposed to follow the pen um, while you are sort of actively bringing up really painful memories. Um, the idea is that you want to decouple big emotion from these memories so that you can just remember things that happened to you in the past um, without getting um, completely overwhelmed by them. So EMDR is it's kind of a, I think the last couple of decades really, um, especially now finding some traction in the sort of trauma world, people who've suffered some emotional trauma. Um, it's not as effective with people who've experienced childhood trauma, mm. but people who've experienced trauma in adulthood are finding some um, some results from this. And there, there are some, some um, pretty rigorous studies comparing this to, for example, just conventional talk therapy. Um, so it's not just this sort of therapizing aspect of it. There seems to be, there seems to be maybe something to this bilateral idea, although it's, no one really knows the mechanism for it. It seems a little bit mysterious, but you know, it kind of makes sense when you think about what already attracted me to things like hiking and walking and paddling. There is something about this bilateral movement that seems to sort of ground your focus, um, you know, embody you in the moment rather than getting carried away, you know, by your emotional brain. So I tried it. I went to a workshop for people who were going through divorce. It was like a two-day workshop. Um, and because we, we were in a group setting, we weren't doing the back and forth with the eyes. We were doing this kind of tapping, like self-tapping on our shoulders where we would cross our arms over our chest and tap um, alternately right and left. And um, it, I actually found it surprisingly somewhat helpful. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been good if I had kept doing it after the workshop, but I didn't. I was, you know, it's expensive and I was doing a lot of other things, but I think it actually really did help. I had some, I had some really powerful insights that I hadn't had before that. Well, it sounds like it may have helped a little bit more than the psychedelics that you tried. You opted for a combination of MDMA and psilocybin. Did it help at all? And I guess uh, if so, why did it not help more, do you think? You know, I actually, I actually feel like the psychedelics was one of the most helpful things I did. Oh, okay. Um, I, I mean, it's, it, it's such a, it's such a weird experience. It's so outside of, you know, anything, you know, we can kind of rationally comprehend, like, why does this seem to be so helpful to so many people who have suffered from PTSD um, or who um, are facing terminal illness or facing uh, depression, battling depression. Uh, a lot of studies starting to emerge now um, showing that this actually is, is kind of surprisingly promising. And so I worked with a therapist uh, in a clinical setting. And um, first I took some MDMA, um, that's sometimes known as ecstasy or molly. And um, that was followed pretty quickly by a dose of psilocybin, pretty large dose of psilocybin. Um, the MDMA is supposed to um, kind of open your mind and really relax you so that you are receptive to the loss of control that you are about to face <laughs> under the psilocybin when your cognitive brain really goes offline. And this can be scary, it can be frightening and scary. So um, the MDMA kind of opens you up to this experience and it makes it feel more benign. 
um, which I was, uh, I think, really needing because I'm someone who doesn't really like to lose control and I associate that with, um, you know, anxiety. So I had this sort of amazing experience. This is all day, you know, six hour trip <laughs> where I envisioned myself as a tree and I envisioned my ex as kind of a strangler vine around my tree trunk. I had been up until this moment, I had been having a lot of trouble saying goodbye to my marriage. It didn't, there was a part of me that didn't really want to separate. And this was, you know, this is like two years later, two years after the split, I was still going through this. So um, under the influence of the psychedelics, I was able to sort of see this in a new light and, and to say, you know what, I'm not able to really grow as a tree with this strangler vine around my trunk. Like I need to, I need to unwrap this vine in order to grow. And it was such a, it was such an effective metaphor. It sounds really goofy to say it, but um, it was kind of a beautiful thing. I was like, I'm a tree. I'm going to grow into the light. I'm going to like hold my pancreas up into the light and it's going to feel better now. <laughs> and, and by the end of this experience, I was honestly more able to separate and say goodbye to my marriage. And I was also less afraid of the future, which is something that the scientists are seeing with people who are facing terminal illness. After these psychedelic experiences, um, they feel less afraid of dying. And it, it probably has to do perhaps with the awe, you know, of the experience itself, this like perspective taking, um, the feeling more connected to things outside of your own ego. Um, it's, it's, I think it's fascinating. As you try and figure out how to regain a sense of happiness, you explored what happiness means. And that uh, included looking at uh, the different sorts of happiness, according to some great philosophers from the past. Greek philosopher Epicurus is a proponent of hedonic happiness, while Aristotle preferred eudaimonic happiness. What is the difference there? Hedonic happiness is the happiness that we associate with um, pleasure and um, mirth and um, like feeling good. He, uh, eudaimonic happiness is more of this kind of purpose-driven happiness where maybe we are working really hard or we're raising small kids and you know not feeling mirthful about all the chores involved in that or working towards, you know, you know, a, a, a university degree or something like that, where we're not going to be, you know, we're stressed out, we're going to be stressed out, but we still have this kind of North star that is giving us purpose and fulfilling us in sort of this more meaningful way. So that's the eudaimonic piece. And so Steve Cole at UCLA um, is, he was the one who talked to me a lot about these different kinds of happinesses, because there are these, um, direct lines to what he's seeing in the blood analysis in people who seem to identify with one type of happiness or the other. Um, and what he's found is, you know, is that it's the people who experience this kind of more eudaimonia who have the healthier profile of um, monocytes and leukocytes in their immune system. So what was the difference between your first two blood tests and that third one that you took with uh, Steve Cole? Yeah, I mean, he told me that, uh, you know, my first two samples really did look like the blood of a lonely person. <laughs> um, and, but yay, by time three, after I'd done the psychedelics, um, after I'd done the EMDR, um, after I had talked to a lot of other people um, suffering from various kinds of emotional, um, you know, trauma and loneliness and so on, um, after I had gone to this museum of, broken relationships in Croatia and learned about sort of the collective power of ritual and, um, um, you know, recognizing that heartbreak is such a shared experience, you know, whatever, all these things, hard to tease out which one was most beneficial, but, but by the end of it, you know, this was like after two years, my blood, yay, started looking better. And, and, and what that means is that I was producing more dendrites, more lymphocytes, um, more of the cells that fight viruses. Uh, and, and some of my inflammation markers had gone down. And this was really great news because, you know, this was, by the time we sat down to talk about this, um, the pandemic had just started. 
new virus coming. I really wanted those viral defenses working and back online. No doubt about that. Uh, last couple of questions here. First off, how much did writing this book help you out and in, uh, in overcoming the divorce or the separation and eventually the divorce? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think initially the research and reporting helped a lot. You know, it gave me um, some purpose, gave me some focus, got me out of bed in the morning and into the field, talking to really interesting scientists and, and other people. Um, all the scientists, by the way, were were great. I mean, I would tell them, you know, I'm heartbroken. I got divorced. <laughs> um, I want to learn about this. Tell me about your voles and your mice and your, you know, genetics. And, and they would all tell me stories of their own heartbreak. That alone, you know, is super helpful. Just connecting to other people, um, you know, who can validate your experiences. Um, I, I found that incredibly helpful. Um, but then, you know, I had to actually go back and, and write the stuff down <laughs> and also write about why I was heartbroken, write about feelings of betrayal, um, write about sort of the, you know, the bad boyfriends, you know, I met along the way. And, and so that, I think in some ways held my feet in the heartbreak zone, you know, for a little bit longer. On the other hand, by the time I was done with the book and really done with it. I was so sick of the topic. I was like, I am done with heartbreak. I'm done, 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 done. <laughs> so there was some sense of closure, but I also think it's important to point out that there's not total closure. No. And I talk about that too, that, that with a lot of these emotional, you know, tragedies that we experience, they don't just go away completely. And that's okay. You know, I learned to become someone who was a little more comfortable with the fact that there are still moments of regret, moments of sadness. It's possible to feel different emotions at the same time. I came to actually really value feeling big emotions, like the bigs, the big ones, the, the highs, the lows. Um, it made me ultimately, even when I was sad, it sort of made me feel more alive. And I think ironically, having gone through the heartbreak, increased, ultimately increased my capacity for love, my capacity to be present, to be a better listener, um, to be more empathetic to other people's pain, to want to help other people. Um, all of these things, you know, finally were a result of heartbreak, but not necessarily a perfect closure. You know, it's not like I don't go back to being the exact same person I was, and that's okay. I think that lends itself to an answer for my final question for you, and that is, are you in a good place now? Oh yeah, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, now so now I'm actually almost five years out, <laughs> and um, there certainly is healing with time. That may be one of the biggest healers of all. Yeah. Um, but I have learned so much about uh, you know who my friends are, and um, I'm able to. I think just have bigger feelings overall. I feel like, I feel, I do feel like, I feel like a human being in a fuller sense in some ways than I did before when I was kind of just really focused on projecting a certain co competence in the world and kind of being good at everything. And um, in some ways kind of numbing to big emotions, because I think a lot of us do that, you know, in, in our modern societies, we're not really taught a lot of emotional intelligence. Um, and I feel like I have that now and I'm grateful for it. I don't, I don't always feel like I have a lot of wisdom every day <laughs> or capacity to love every minute, but, but in general, I've got a lot more of it. Well, hopefully you're not still in touch with, uh, Ennis, the lady boner killer, if nothing else. <laughs> Um, no, actually I am. And, and, and we're kind of pals. Um, right. We're pals. And um, I, I have a lot of actual fondness for Ennis and I have fondness for my ex. And, um, you know, I feel like even when these guys and all of us sometimes make mistakes and don't treat each other so well, you know, it comes from a place of, again, just kind of being human and messing up and not necessarily being a terrible person. So I feel like I have a lot more even empathy for the, the guys who hurt me. That is a, a very mature answer there. She is Florence Williams, an award-winning journalist, author, and podcaster whose work focuses on the environment, health, and science. 
Her newest book is titled Heartbreak, A Personal and Scientific Journey. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Florence, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this wonderful book. I think it's a great blend of uh, you really exposing your personal journey while also enlightening the rest of us on the science behind heartbreak. Thank you, Trey. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Join me next time when I speak with author Ian Miller on Unmasked, the global failure of COVID mask mandates. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.